That is a life verse for me. To live under condemnation is to not live at all. You know what condemnation is. You have the opportunity to um, become a person who is on death row. Read it with me out loud, folks. Romans 8, 1 through 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. In the New and the Living Bible translation, it says there's now no condemnation awaiting those who belong to Christ Jesus for the power of the life-giving Spirit, and this power is mine through Christ Jesus, has freed me from the vicious cycle of sin and death. From a famous uh, trials quote, there was a trip to Rome in 1510 that caused Martin Luther to begin to seriously question certain Catholic practices. And the opportunity for the trip arose when Luther was selected as one of two Augustinian brothers to travel to the Eternal City to help resolve a dispute within the order that called for resolution by the Pope. Augustine was a popular father of the church who, and this order that he was in, was founded by Augustine. Augustine had a tremendous conversion and knew the power of the grace of God to convert his soul. However, when Luther, what Luther saw in Rome disillusioned him as he watched incompetent, flippant, and cynical clergy performing their holy duties, he began to experience doubts about the Catholic Church, at least about the doctrine that he was learning there. He wrote after his journey that he had gone with onions and returned with garlic. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I heard, and I've said it many times, somebody said you can have faith that's as sweet smelling as roses or as strong smelling as onions. And he says he returned with garlic. Could you bow your heads for a moment while we renew our commitment and prayer to the Lord's, for the Lord's help? Shield me, Father, from all unrighteousness, and may your words flow, because we need your words in this next little bit that we're going to have to present your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to buy five minutes from you. Can I buy five minutes right now? Yes? Raise your hand if I'm buying five minutes. Thank you very much. Did Martin Luther's 95 Theses need a Reformation, Sabbath, October 28th? Did the Reformation starter need a Reformation? You know, uh, this is the very first thing that was on the board, on the paper that Martin Luther put up. And it's, it, you need to realize that Martin Luther was a scholar. And he's presenting these 95 theses as he had already presented others with the option that people would do what is in this, what we're getting ready, ready to read. Out of love for the truth and from desire to elucidate it, the Reverend Father Martin Luther, Master of Arts and Sacred Theology, an ordinary lecturer therein at Wittenberg, intends to defend the following statements and to dispute on them in that place at Wittenberg. Therefore, he asks that those who cannot be present and dispute with him orally shall do so in their absence by letter, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's a scholar. He's presenting these 95 Theses as something that he expects someone to come and listen to him talk about. You know, it wasn't that, um, it wasn't like some kind of, uh, let's see here, it wasn't really a lot of people that gathered around to see him post those up. You see all those other papers there? This was the town bulletin board. This was your Facebook page, whatever you want to call it. There he is, and um, it, it was something that he had done before and will continue to do. 
Now this is a thesis number 45. Now we're going to find out if there's anything in here that needs a reformation. Because love grows by works of love, man therefore becomes better. Man does not, however, become better by means of indulgences, but is merely freed from penalties. Number 81. This unbridled preaching of indulgences makes it difficult even for learned men to rescue the reverence which is due the Pope from slander or from the shrewd questions of the laity. I want you to see that within here, some of us have a very, oh, I would say, Reader's Digest condensed version of what Luther was about. However, penances were very much a part of being a Catholic in those days. And so Luther is, is talking about the use of penances, but he's not saying that they shouldn't be used or that they weren't a part of his understanding of salvation. What he's saying is the unbridled preaching of indulgences. He didn't like the way they were being preached. But my favorite part here, this is number 81, is um, he wants to protect the pope from the slander that, he, that the pope is due. So he's yielding a reverence to the Pope in this. And then second, from the shrewd questions of the laity. You know, the laity aren't all that dumb, are we? No, the laity we can see, and I have had the most profound questions asked to me by people that I'm studying the Bible with, and I'll say, you know, that's the one that the theologians are still trying to figure out. And they'll figure out that question, and they'll ask that question. You know, if this is a wonderful God, why do we live in an evil world? That, that's called the Odyssey. So here we go, number 82. Some questions that came up after Tetzel was selling his indulgences. He says, why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love? You know, why are funeral and anniversary masses for the dead continued since it's wrong to pray for the redeemed? Uh, what is this new piety of God and the Pope that for a consideration of money they permit a man who is impious and their enemy to buy out of purgatory the pious soul of a friend of God and do not rather because of the need of that pious and beloved soul free it for love's pure sake, for pure love's sake. You know this teaching was that the soul of that person was in a place called purgatory. And purgatory is not a way down, purgatory is a way up, as we're going to see in just a moment. Um, the thing that we need to find out really is why are the penitential canons long since abrogated and dead in actual fact and through disuse, boy you're going to fall asleep on this one, now satisfied by the grant of indulgence as though they were still alive in force. So they went back and got some old rules and said, okay, we're going to use those old rules to get you to pay some more money to, for these indulgences. You know, why does not the Pope, whose wealth is today greater than the wealth of the richest Crossus, build this one basilica of St. Peter with his own money, rather than with the money of poor believers? You know what was going on. Why does the Pope remit or grant to those who by perfect contrition, perfect contrition, you know, being sorry for your souls, for your soul's sins, perfect contrition. Why does the Pope remit or grant to those who, by perfect contrition, already have a right to full remission and blessings? You know, as much as we think that um, Luther understood that we are saved by grace through faith and not by your works, perfect contrition means that my ability to perfectly confess my souls and feel sorry for them and not want to do them again. This is like being held as one more thing before you can have, make heaven your home. What greater blessing could come to the church than if the Pope were to bestow these remissions and blessings on every believer a hundred times a day as he now does but once. And since the Pope, now he's giving the Pope a real, um, a good character. He's saying since the Pope seeks the salvation of souls rather than money by his indulgences, in other words, Pope is not doing this because he needs the money, he's doing this because he's seeking these souls to be able to have this perfect contrition that will get them able to be, make heaven their home. Why does he suspend the indulgences and pardons previously granted when they have equal efficacy? So somebody had already bought their indulgence, but those are suspended because now you get to buy a new one. That's what that says. 
Now, to repress these very sharp arguments of the laity by force alone, in other words, we're going to arrest you because you're talking against the Pope. We're not going to let you come to church. We're going to excommunicate you. We're going to put you out. And if we put you out, you can't have your sins forgiven. If you can't have your sins forgiven, you can't make it to the heavenly kingdom. Instead, you are condemned to an eternal burning hell. All right. To repress these very sharp arguments of the laity by force alone, and not to resolve them by giving reasons, is to expose the church and the pope to the ridicule of their enemies. There was the Muslims that were conquering Europe at the time. And to make Christians unhappy. So now number 91, and of course there's going to be some more after that, because it's thesis, 95 thesis. If therefore indulgences were preached according to the spirit and intention of the pope, all these doubts would be readily resolved. Indeed, they would not exist. Is he defending the Pope? What do you think? Sounds like it to me. Away then with all these prophets who say to the people, peace, peace, and there is no peace. In other words, if you bought these indulgences, you don't have to worry about your own repentance. You don't have to worry about your own contrition. But 93 says, blessed be all those prophets, blessed be all those prophets who say to the people, cross, cross, and there is no cross. Christians should be exhorted to be diligent in following Christ their head through penalties death and hell. Penalties. And thus, if you could do that, you'd be confident of entering into heaven through many tribulations rather than through the false security of peace. All in the 95 Thesis you find the doctrine of the Catholic Church of penance and you find the doctrine of the reverence of the Pope having the authority to put somebody in and take somebody out. Please read it with me again, this time from the Living Bible. So there is now no condemnation awaiting those who belong to Christ Jesus. I want to hear it. For the power of the life-giving Spirit, and this power is mine through Christ Jesus, has freed me from the vicious cycle of sin and death. The reason that the translator says, and this power is mine through Christ Jesus, is because it's the in Christ motif. We don't have this except for when we are in Christ. But we have the power of the life-giving spirit. Now these 95 theses that were published in October of 1517 were preceded by 97 theses that nobody made a whole lot about. But um, nobody really answered his call to debate. But it was much more revealing of his grace theology. Also had the nature of free will and predestination or election. You can't believe how this uh, predestination and election is tied in to these uh, reformers' doctrines. But I did find one that pretty much talked about maybe what uh, Luther believed, whether we can make heaven our home. We do not become righteous by doing righteous deeds, but having been made righteous, we do righteous deeds. Do you believe that? Yes. How do we get made righteous? through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, who was made righteous. And this is in opposition to the philosophers. Well, uh, the philosophers were all tied up being part of Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's theology. Now, in October of 1517, remember, the other one was from the September, no big deal. Now, a month later, he puts these up. Now, the 95 Theses were originally written in Latin. Luther spoke Latin more than he spoke Greek, uh, German. He lived in a he was a monk. He was in a monastery, and he spoke Latin very. It's like you speak English, and so others had to print those ninety five theses, translate them, and put them into German. And you saw at the beginning he was asking people to come and debate this because he was going to be in Wittenberg talking about this, and nobody called out. Nobody came to debate him. It wasn't a big deal when it went up on the board. But when it was translated into German, put it on a paper, and sent everywhere throughout Germany, then a lot of people uh, didn't even come and get upset with him. Why? Because a lot of people thought that these, um, the way that these indulgences were being sold was ridiculous. The guy would come to town um, with a big cross, with a big uh, entourage, and then he'd set up camp, he'd preach a real fire and brimstone sermon, one that would make it so hard for uh, people to not be crying for their loved ones. And then he would say, you know, if you would, would be um, 
able to give some money, we can get your loved ones out of purgatory. Remember I said that purgatory, you need to think about it as a way up and not a place down? In medieval salvation, and I really appreciate Ryan Reeves, PhD from Gordon-Conwell Theology Sem Theological Seminary. That is a, a multi-denominational seminary, but he definitely leans toward Reformed theology. But this is a picture, if you look at this slide, of what it meant to be born Catholic. When you are born Catholic, you are born and need baptismal regeneration. And so you're christened at seven days, just like the Jews were circumcised on the eighth day. The, they were christened on seven days. And that made you enter into a state of grace. Don't think that the Catholics don't have an attractive doctrine. Their state of grace comes instantly at child baptism, which is the sprinkling of the christening, okay? This is who Luther was. This is what he believed. This is what he taught before his awakening. That state of grace. Now this is sort of like going through a car wash. You get the sin washed off you at the beginning, but the rest of your life, you're going to be at getting sinning, sinning sins on you. So now you get to get rid of those sins, and the goal is to get the sins off of you on your way to heaven. But you're going to get to go to purgatory where they're really going to be purged off. So purgatory is on the way to heaven. But the only way that you can get those sins that you've splashed on your clean car off is by doing confession and absolution from the priest. And the priest is the only one who can give you that confession or hear your confession. You're not allowed to go to the, on your own knees and say, Dear Heavenly Father, by the power of the name of Jesus, please forgive me my sins. I did this today. Nope. You've got to say, got to go to the little door, open the little door, and watch that the priest comes out. And you're going to tell him what you did. Now that, not, that in itself not only makes you dirty, it makes the priest dirty. Let's not be honest about that. A lot of... Uh, awesome, awful things were confessed. However, you're, you're not done yet. You have to do some penance. And penance is like, it, if you really think about it, we, we can't be so critical because what penance was in the mind of a, a, you know, to him who was pure, all things are pure, penance was to make you not want to do it again. You know, if you had to do um, so many Hail Marys, so many Our Fathers, because I used to go with my girlfriend on Saturdays, we'd ride our bicycles over to Blessed Sacrament Church in Toledo, Ohio, and I'd wait for her outside when she went and made confession because she was going to go to Mass the next morning, and she would come back and tell me, well, I, you know, I confessed my sins, but, you know, I had to do so many Hail Marys, so many Our Fathers, and I had to, whatever else she had to do. But that would mean, that was the penance. That was to make her not want to do it again. What do you think? Good idea. I got a spanking. I didn't want to do it again. But these were things that penance was going to do. Put it in your mind. That was really wrong. Put it in your mind. You really don't want to do it again. And penance was supposed to lead you to that. So you wouldn't put so much dirt on your, on your clean car. When it came time for indulgences, which I told you, indulgences were already part of the... Um, Catholic Church way before um, uh, Reformation Day in um, 1517. They were normal, and, and they had them. And what could happen is you could pay some money, which is actually just like supporting the church. And so in exchange for supporting the church, instead of doing other good works of penance, of feeding the poor or doing something else, by giving the money you were supporting the church, this is another good work and that indulgence that you did was in the place of your penance. But it was also to make you realize, you know, sin is not cheap. You're going to have to do something if you're going to want to get rid of this dirt on your, on your car that you got clean when you went through as a baby and entered that state of grace. So actually, you're looking to proceed toward heaven by getting this absolution from the priest who is going to assign you the indulgence, you're going to go back to a state of grace until the next time you sin, in which case you repeat the cycle. Romans 8 has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, um, the issue of 
of indulgences actually really became a proxy war for the real issue, which was the authority of the Pope. And in this, this thing, as, um, <laughs> as a priest, Luther thought selling indulgences weakened his flock's personal motivation to seek divine grace. See, if you thought you could pay it off, you're not going to really seek for the grace to overcome your, your sinful life. And then he thought it was an exploitation also, and he was especially angered by the flagrant hawking of indulgences in German lands, German lands by the papal agent Johannes Tetzel, who is credited with the phrase, when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from, the purgator from purgatory springs. And here's a picture of him setting up his um, selling of these indulgences. Remember, he's not the only one who had indulgences. Indulgences were common. They were a way of substituting for penance. And you had to do penance in order to make you go back into the state of grace, which meant your sins were gone. Now, this monetization of faith was an abuse of church practice. So what did he do? He writes a copy of his 95 Theses. He gives them in a letter to his archbishop, Albrecht of Mance, and I'm not going to read all this because we've got to get done. Um, so his letter, Albrecht doesn't even um, write back to him. Guess why? Because Albrecht had purchased his archbishopship with money that he owed, and he was getting part of the money back from sell the indulgences. And Pope Leo and uh, the, the tenth and Albrecht are dividing the proceeds proceeds from the sale of the indulgences. To finance one thing, the lavish construction of St. C. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and to pay Albrecht's debts. So, there is a broader challenge that these two, after Albrecht receives the thesis, has somebody study it for him, because he's not really a great theologian himself, and he says, I think there's a problem sending him on to the Pope. And we can see that at this point, we're taking away the Pope's um, possibilities of being in ultimate control. So the conflict shapes up and eventually then those 95 theses are actually a, a manifesto of um, this part of it. That the right of the Pope to interpret scripture, the Pope papacy's interpretation is the only correct one, and the authority of the Pope to rule over um, everything. Pope Leo X, um, he kind of backs up and says, yeah, I agree that there were some things wrong with the way that they're implying doing these. Indulgences apply only to penalty. In other words, the penalty, penance, the thing that you had to do to um, fulfill your uh, confession, it only applies to that. It doesn't apply to guilt. In other words, he's saying uh, Jesus can still take away the guilt. Or the you know going to going to the mass and taking the, the little wafer will and that'll take away your guilt. But it's only the penalty. So the Pope's trying to let himself off the hook. He writes this thing, Decretal on Indulgences, that only the temporal pains of earth and purgatory may be remitted. So we're going to get you out of a little bit of purgatory here. But the Pope has complete power over the, over those earthly penalties he imposes. And the penalties of purgatory, the Pope may only present to God by way of petition. And then guess what? You could have the superfluous merits of Christ, or you could have the superfluous merits of the saints. The saints had stored up some good stuff. You could, uh, you could um, put that on your account. This is ridiculous that I'm even going to try to present this sermon today. <laughs> There's so much to do. They had... You know, we have um, football matches and baseball matches and, uh, and soccer matches. They had debate matches. The universities were, uh, were lined up against each other. And in Leipzig, Leipzig had a, a main um, scholar whose name was Eck. Eck, Luther had a scholar. Uh, Wittenberg had a scholar, Luther, but Luther wasn't the, wasn't the top dog. So he, wasn't, he was like second chair. And so Andreas Karlstadt, was the first chair for, for Wittenberg. They went four sessions, 18 days, discussing free will, biblical interpretation, and papal authority. Now here's where it gets really hard. That's just a little, little bit of a picture of them uh, de debating back and forth. This is, this is what Luther wanted. Luther wanted discussion of those 95 theses. He wanted somebody to, to refute those, if they could. But in the Leipzig disputation, 
the things that happened was Eck, brilliant scholar that he was, brilliant debate um, person that he was, and used to this, he got, he essentially got uh, Luther to admit that the Pope can err, he got him to admit that the councils can err, and he got him to admit that scripture alone cannot err, and its interpretation must reign over our church. This is what John Huss believed. And John Huss, who was burned at the stake in 1415, remember this is 1517, that the 95 Thesis come up, Haas was burned as a heretic in 1415 for what? For believing the Pope can err, the councils can err, and the scripture alone cannot err, and its interpretation must reign over our church. And so, uh, Eck asks him, and of course, you know, nobody was there, the tape recorder wasn't rolling, um, but it's recorded that Haas asks him, are you a Hussite? And Luther says, yeah, ich bin Hussite. And I, yes, I am a Hussite. If you're a Hussite, we just read what happened to Huss. He died as a, a heretic, burned at the stake in 1415, and he, he was supposed to be given a safe conduct. That's why he came and presented himself to the council, but the safe conduct somehow wasn't signed by the exactly right people, and so guess what? He didn't get to have his safe conduct, and before he even got convicted, they took him and they burned him at the stake. The Pope is really excited about having Eck back Luther into the corner, and he says, Arise, O Lord. Oh, this is from Psalm 7 and verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger, lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. Guess what the papal bull condemning Luther is called? It's called Arise, O Lord, because that's the church, and the church has got an enemy now. So he's, he sends it off to Luther, um, official copy. He, he does it in June, 1520. The copy gets there to Luther in October, and it's called Arise, O Lord. Now, the bull accuses Luther of heresy and issues an ultimatum, recant the her heretical statements in the 95 Theses and other writings within 60 days or face excommunication. Luther's works were to be burned in public, and all Christians who owned, read, or published them faced automatic excommunication as well. Luther's works were to be burned in public. Well, Luther now had reason to fear for his life. The punishment for heresy was burning at the stake, and so he sent that, that, that threatening him with excommunication but then eventually he is he is officially excommunicated in 1521. They they had the system just like we would um, that the um, it's like the Jews in the uh, in the Jesus crucifixion. The church the Jews had the right to condemn him as a heretic, but the Romans had to be the one who had the civil authority to put him to death. So Luther is standing and after the the. Pope sends out his decretal saying that Luther's a heretic, he has to go before a civil court. Now the civil court is Emperor Charles V and it was conducted in the free city of all the German words that start with W sound like V, okay? And the words that have start with F sound like V uh, is V and uh, W is Worms. So this is the city of Worms. Burns. He's there to renounce or reaffirm his views in response to a papal bull, which we just already talked about. Guess who the, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V is? He was a Charles I of Spain. Now he's the one who's going to be the one that's going to condemn to death Luther. I don't know. I have so much more to say, but you know what? I'm a respecter of your time and my time. So what I'm going to do is, uh, next time we get together, maybe I'll do a review and we'll, sh we'll share this. In the meantime, do you wonder if Luther died? Was he, was he burned at the stake like Huss? I'm going to invite you to turn, to go back to that person that I said, Ryan Reeves. YouTube, Ryan Reeves, Theology, 
uh, of the Reformation. He's a lecturer with all these, you don't see his face, you just see picture after picture, and it's really, really worth it. So that's my thought for you. Um, in the meantime, it is time for our closing hymn, which I want to bring your attention to. Please open up your hymnals to number 506. This closing hymn is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A Mighty Fortress is Our God was a hymn that was used by Luther. Now, it didn't